Mistake number seven. We won't let our kids struggle or fight. Now, when I use the word fight, I, I don't mean a fist fight. I mean to really um, battle or struggle through difficulties, challenges, um, even opportunities that seem a little harder than the child first expected. You and I both know that that's what life is about, working through hard problems and becoming stronger as we work through them. But for some reason, as I mentioned earlier, there, there is a new parent report card on the horizon today that says if you're a good parent, your children shouldn't struggle, they should have everything they want, they should be happy. And while we always want that, that comes through struggle. And we turn out better adults in the end if we let our kids struggle a little bit rather than have a life of ease and convenience all the time. Maybe you've heard of Singapore Math. Singapore Math is a two-day workshop given to teachers in America, when com and, and it compares children in Singapore to children in America. Now, both sets of children are smart, but in Singapore, they've embedded into the math curriculum uh, soft skills like attitude and resilience and perseverance. We don't necessarily do that in America. So, given the same math problem, students in Singapore were willing to work an hour or more on a single math problem before they got it right. American children worked 37 seconds before they gave up. Now, I don't think that means they're not smart. I think it means they've been used to not struggling and things have been easy. We kind of spoon fed them. Um, I know a school that doesn't use red ink when they grade papers anymore because we felt like it was too harsh. Again, this is our adult world meaning well, intending well, but not allowing them to get a glimpse of what life is like. In fact, I think we've done a lot better job pre uh, protecting than we have preparing. Can I say that again? We've done a better job protecting than preparing. So my correction on this one is very simple. I want to encourage you, when you see your child struggle, don't remove it right away. Sit down with them, listen to them, cry with them, pray with them, but see them through the struggle and watch them grow resilient in the process. Mistake number eight, we give them what they should earn. I mentioned earlier that I feel like we're in a new day and we parents feel like when we look around us at other parents, we should be giving our children everything they want. And along the way, sometimes we can um, sabotage their maturation. We start producing young adults in their teens or 20s that feel entitled to things because they've always been given to them. My son Jonathan is 23 years old and a few years ago he was helping a theater arts program in our community do a competition. After it was over, he came to me and said, Dad, you won't believe what these adults did. I said, tell me. He said, well, every student that came through the door, I mean, this is high school, middle school, elementary school, every kid that went through the door got a gold medal hung around their neck just for walking in the door, just for breathing air, they got a gold medal. And then as they competed on the stage, they got more medals for singing, acting, and dancing. The levels of the medals were gold, high gold, and platinum. Gold was the lowest you could get. You could get last place and get a gold medal. And then, if that's not bad enough, the host of the competition stood up at the end and said, on sale in the lobby are more trophies and medals. If your child did not get the medal you had wanted them to get, you can buy them uh, in the lobby. Now, I understand we want our kids to have gold medals and trophies and so forth, but you and I both know that is not even remotely like the world they're about to go in for, where their boss is not going to be clapping for them every Friday because they showed up at work on time. So again, we've got to not give them what they should earn. If, if we give them what they, should, what they should earn, we stop, we reduce their ability to learn to work and wait for things. So I love my friend David. His son Nick was in middle school when the new iPod had just come out. And he said, Dad, I want this iPod. My friend said, how much money you got? He said, well, I don't have enough money for it, but they're going fast. They're going to be gone in a week. My friend did a brilliant thing. He said, Nick, I'm going to buy this iPod to make sure we have it in our home, but I'm going to put it high on a shelf and you're going to make monthly payments to me from now on until you earn that iPod. Now, it seemed harsh at first, but month by month for the next nine months, Nick made payments as an eighth grade kid. David told me at the end, Nick was so grateful for that iPod, and he had learned the art of working and waiting along the way. That's the correction I want to encourage you to make.
Mistake number nine, we praise the wrong things. I want to tell you about an experiment that was done at Columbia University by Dr. Carol Dweck, who now is at Stanford. She discovered that 85% of American parents believe it's very important to tell their child, you must be smart, you're a smart kid. And the reason we do that is because we think it's going to give them a little confidence the next time they take a test in school. She had a sneaking suspicion it was backfiring as she watched thousands of kids in New York. And so she did an experiment. She divided two groups of 10-year-old children, gave them both the same test, but at the end of the test, the first group was told, you must be smart. The second group was told, you must have really tried hard. You see, they affirmed effort rather than smarts. In the second round of the experiment, they gave a seventh grade level test, two grades higher, and they said, you don't have to take this one, it's harder. Do you want to? Almost none of the kids in the first group wanted to take the test. The ones that had just been told they were smart didn't want to take it. It's almost like they were thinking, I don't think I'm that smart, actually. <laughs> I'm going to stop right here with you're smart. Almost every kid in the second group that had been affirmed for their effort wanted to take the test. In the third round of tests that were given, they gave the same fifth grade level test, and the kids in the first group that had been affirmed for smarts and intelligence did 30% worse. And it was at that point Dr. Dweck drew this conclusion. We discovered that when you affirm variables that are out of their control, you produce a fixed mindset. The kids in the first group did 30% worse on the test. So what she says is to correct the affirmation problem we have in America is we need to affirm variables that are in their control, like honesty or the strategy they used on that math problem or how well they kept a good attitude when they were cleaning the room as opposed to smarts or beauty which are out of their control.